This lecture is part of a series of lectures for RAD229, MRI Signals and Sequences, offered in the Department of Radiology at Stanford University. The 14th lecture on magnetization preparation is divided into two parts. Lecture 14b covers saturation, inversion, and other contrast preparations. The learning objectives for this lecture are to describe several forms of saturation pulse, to list and explain three uses of inversion nulling, to describe T2 prep sequences and their effect, to describe a driven equilibrium sequence, to explain magnetization transfer and cest, to explain long T2 suppression, and to qualitatively describe diffusion encoding. To review the previous lecture, we looked at saturation pulses, and the most common example of this perhaps is fat saturation. And the way this uh, technique works is we play a pulse that excites only the fat signal, followed by a dephaser. This removes fat, ideally, from the image, and then we can go about our normal imaging sequence as seen on the right. In the frequency domain, we have a selective pulse, in this case frequency selective, around fat, shown by the orange pulse. This excites the fat, and then the fat is removed, and then we play the broader band pulse that would other otherwise excite both fat and water, and we go about our normal sequence. These are the cases where we see where fat suppression works, where we accidentally uh, fail to suppress fat, and where we accidentally suppress water, and these um, unwanted effects are typically because of background uh, static magnetic field in homogeneities. So there are other forms of saturation that are common. One of them is a spatial saturation approach. So here we want to do reduced field of view imaging because it may be faster. Um, so what we do is we saturate bands outside of the field of view to, present, to prevent the signal from these bands from aliasing into the field of view. So here's an example. This is a fetal image here. And you see on the left, a full field of view, a single shot spin echo image. And on the right, when we use a spatial saturation band, we can remove the signal that's coming from the mother's body uh, and might otherwise obscure the fetal image. Another example is shown here on the right, again with the same kind of sequence here. On the left image of those two, you see that the arms here are aliasing into the image, and when we apply a spatial saturation outside the body to the left and the right, we see that we remove this aliasing. So the spatial saturations are generally to pre prevent some kind of aliasing effect. Just to give a little bit of an idea how these spatial saturations can work, uh, first of all, you can use them with arbitrary sequences. And as you see in the diagram here, really starting with the bottom, you can have these uh, saturation bands in different directions. So you can actually build up a non-square uh, saturation region here, um, almost an elliptical saturation region here. Also notice that when you're doing a saturation pulse, you don't actually care about the phase of the excitation. So there are all kinds of tricks you can do here. You can make very selective pulses. You can cosine modulate them so that you excite two saturation bands at a time. So there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, work here with saturations that you can see in an RF pulse design course. But it's good to know how these spatial saturations work. Another very interesting form of saturation is myocardial tagging. And here you can uh, basically saturate uh, lines or a grid in the image here. So the pulse is shown here, where you basically take the RF pulse and you've broken the RF pulse up into sort of a comb function. And then your excited pattern will have basically this periodicity to it. This is often included with a cine acquisition to look at the heart. So here are some example images. This is a balanced SSFP approach on the left here. So you see a few things here going on here. You see the lines in the heart and you can see the muscle of the heart moving, the myocardium moving. You also see that the tags wear off as the signal approaches the steady state over the course of the heartbeat. You can also do this with a, an RF spoiled approach or a flash approach, and we get a little bit different contrast with this. But again, the 
preparation can work with different acquisition sequences here. And the best choice may depend somewhat on the application here. So another very common approach to magnetization preparation is inversion recovery. And this is often used for nulling, such as in the STIR approach, which stands for short TI inversion recovery, sometimes called short tau inversion recovery, but either way it's called STIR and it does the same thing. So we start the sequence with a 180 degree inversion and the signals now recover with a different T1. So we have our inversion pulse and the signal recovery of the magnetization. And what we want to do is excite at the null point for whatever tissue we want to null. So in this case, we want to null the fat. So we will excite when that yellow trace passes through zero. So we have a short inversion time. And ideally here, now we have a signal that has no fat signal. So the fat has been nulled. So this is another form of fat suppression that is based on the T1 difference between fat and other tissues. Notice also that we've lost some signal from the orange tissue because we have some signal recovery here. Uh, and we've lost some of that signal, so we'll lose some SNR in our other tissue when we use uh, STIR here. So this is a comparison of STIR versus, versus fat saturation. So remember, STIR is T1 based, so it's less sensitive to B0 variations. In these examples, the subject has metal in his or her knee, and the fat saturation fails quite badly because of the B0 variations, but the STIR approach suppresses the fat quite uniformly regardless of the background static magnetic field. Again, notice that the STIR costs SNR. Although these are acquired with different parameters, it's quite clear that the image on the right is quite a bit more noisy. And then a final point that's quite important is that STIR doesn't work very well with gadolinium enhancement because gadolinium enhanced signal has a short T1 similar to fat and STIR actually suppresses the signal. So another approach with inversion recovery is called flare or fluid attenuated inversion recovery. And this is fluid suppression based on T1. So in the brain, we might want to suppress the cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. So what we do is we again play an inversion pulse. And now what we're going to do is have a longer inversion time in order to null the fluid signal, which is shown by the orange trace here. And the shorter T1 signals shown by the yellow will not be nulled. So again, we'll null these and we'll play these out to acquire our images. You see in these images here, we have a T2 weighted image and right in the middle of the image, you see the bright CSF. And this is suppressed in both of the images on the right. And notice that flare can be combined with a T2 weighted sequence as well as with a T1 weighted sequence. So there are different ways to do flare uh, and combine them with the sequence to get different contrasts, but both with this fluid suppression. So let's look at a question with inversion nulling. So let's think about what are the inversion times to null fat, which has a T1 of about 250 milliseconds, and CSF, where the T1 is assumed to be 2000 milliseconds or two seconds. Now the hint here is that e to the minus 0.7 is approximately 0.5. So the answer, this is quite a good hint, because basically what we want is for half of the exponential decay to have happened. So if we have a perfect inversion, when half of that decay has happened, we will pass through zero, and that's our null point. So we want Ti to be 0.7 times T1, and this is a formula you should really try to remember. So for fat, the Ti is about 175 milliseconds, and for CSF, it's about 1.4 seconds. So we also often use an inversion recovery preparation to enhance the T1 contrast rather than to simply null tissue. So this is often used with gradient spoiled imaging, which has a mixed contrast, and this is MP rage. So in this example on the left, you see a balanced SSFP sequence with no magnetization preparation, and the signal is pretty steady throughout the cardiac cycle. On the right, you see an inversion recovery preparation and you see that the septum or the area between the ventricles here is quite dark initially, quite well suppressed, but it actually recovers. So you see this sort of transient contrast. So it's quite a nice example of this, uh, this transient contrast that you can get when the magnetization preparation wears off.
Okay, so here's another example combining magnetization preparation approaches, and this is inflow enhanced magnetic resonance angiography. So the preparation here is to do a background suppression using an, an, a slice selective inversion as shown in the timing diagram at right. And then we wait some time and then we do a spectral inversion recovery to suppress the fat. And then we do a balanced SSFP sequence here. Now during this inversion time, the blood flows into the slice. So ideally we suppress all of the tissue that isn't flowing into the slice. And then we just get a blood selective image. So the result of this looks something like this, where we can see uh, renal arteries here quite clearly. Um, this is without the use of a contrast agent. We've just taken advantage of the fact that the blood is flowing into the slice fairly quickly, or the slab fairly quickly. So we suppress the background, we suppress the fat, and the blood flows in and we have this bright blood signal. So this brings us to another question re related to inversion recovery. What happens if the inversion has too low of a flip angle. What happens to the recovery curve? So this is the whole shape of that exponential curve, including the null point time. So what happens is the curve shifts upward, so it will actually reach the null point quicker because the difference between the equilibrium magnetization and the starting magnetization will decrease. So the null occurs earlier, as I said. And how might you address this imperfect flip angle? And the answer here depends a bit on what you're using this for. So if you're trying to do T1 fitting by measuring points along the curve, you can actually model the inversion efficiency or flip angle in the T1 fitting. Or you can use adiabatic inversion pulses, which are a bit better at achieving a, a full inversion in the presence of a B1 transmit uh, variation. So another interesting uh, magnetization preparation is T2 preparation or T2 prep, which is used to enhance the T2 contrast. And what we do here is we tip the magnetization into the transverse plane. And then we, following some interval, we restore the magnetization back to the longitudinal axis here. And this allows for some T2 decay and contrast to form. So the sequence looks something like this. We typically play our excitation and then we will refocus the magnetization once or more before the tip up pulse or minus 90 pulse here. And this time here interval is used for uh, T2 decay to impose this T2 contrast onto the sequence. So this can be used in conjunction with a regular imaging sequence that may not have much T2 contrast. So here's an example uh, showing a renal artery seen on the, on the sort of center to the right of the image here following a T2 prep here. So that has T2 prep and FATSAT. So here's another example using actually inversion recovery to su suppress fluid and T2 prep uh, in combination. So the inversion here suppresses the synovial fluid. You see pockets of very bright signal on the left here. And then on the right, we use a T2 prep, and this will actually create T2 contrast between the arterial and the venous blood, which have T2s somewhere on the order of 100 and 200 uh, milliseconds for venous and arterial blood. So what you see is the sort of gray areas of the veins and the bright areas in between are actually the arteries here uh, in this uh, signal on the right. So this again is an example of using multiple preparation blocks to enhance the contrast. And this is a, a fairly high resolution, uh, sort of one millimeter by one millimeter by one millimeter 3D image of the foot. Okay, so let's look at a question for T2 prep. So what are the pros and cons of using the 180 degree refocusing pulses in the T2 prep sequence? So the advantage is that this reduces the sensitivity to static magnetic field inhomogeneities. The negative side is that this increases the RF power or SAR. So second question is if we use varying T2 prep lengths to measure T2, what is the effect of T2 contrast that's inherently in the sequence? And the answer here is a bit arguable, but in most cases there'll be no effect. So the T2 contrast of the sequence will just scale the T2 prep contrast. So ideally we can do this regardless of our imaging sequence that we use and the, the background contrast can sort of cancel out if we're trying to measure T2.
Okay, so related to the T2 prep is what's called fast recovery or driven equilibrium tip-up pulses. And what we do here is after the sequence, we're going to try to restore the, long, the tran transverse magnetization to the longitudinal axis. And this will enhance the T1 recovery, assuming we have sufficient signal left over, so for longer T2s. And in the steady state, this actually becomes T2 over T1 weighted contrast. So we have the excitation shown by the 90 degree pulse, we have some T2 decay, and then we restore this leftover magnetization, and we have T1 recovery. So you can sort of start to see that we, we need to have a sufficiently long T2 decay to have a signal left over, but we're still going to have some T1 recovery here, which is going to uh, give us this uh, T2 over T1 contrast where we need both a substantial T2 as well as a moderately short T1 in order to have some recovery. Otherwise, the signal will never recover and will reach a steady state that's lower. So this is how the fast recovery or driven equilibrium approach looks in a pulse sequence. We play a pulse sequence, which is typically a spin echo train sequence here with 90 degree excitation and 180 degree pulses. And you see at the end, what we'll do is following an acquisition, we'll play another refocusing 180 degree pulse and at the spin echo, we'll play this minus 90 degree pulse. So you notice that the sequence has considerable symmetry to it uh, from the excitation all the way to the tip up pulse. And this is an example of where this is used. This is a spine image. And I happen to know that the TR of the sequence is about two seconds. Now CSF in the spine may have a T1 that's maybe as long as three seconds. So what you see here is that the fast recovery takes advantage of the long T2 of the CSF and recovers this so that you can acquire this image with a relatively short TR, but still get this bright fluid contrast. Okay, so another uh, contrast that's very interesting is called magnetization transfer contrast. And what we do here is we have some tissues that exhibit magnetization transfer and what we have is we have what are called bound macromolecules that are interacting with free water. So what we're going to do is take advantage of these interactions here to change the contrast in the sequence to show these interactions. So the bound tissue has a very broad spectrum, which corresponds to a very short T2 or fast decay, whereas the free water has a very narrow uh, spectrum as shown here by the blue. And what happens is we basically can play a saturation pulse that saturates away uh, from zero here. So what we're doing is we're saturating the bound pool water here. And then what happens is because of the exchange between free water and bound water, we end up saturating the free water pool and attenuating the signal here. So this leads to magnetization transfer contrast here. And we can talk about the magnetization transfer ratio, which is basically the magnetization without the saturation minus the magnetization with the saturation divided by the magnetization without the saturation here. Okay. And then we'll talk briefly about CEST, which is chemical ex exchange saturation transfer, which is a bit different because the saturation frequency now actually matters. So this is just an example of MT that I happen to have and this is very interesting because if we actually think about an interleaved multi-slice sequence, it has off-resonance pulses because other slices are simply off-resonance pulses that are actually saturating the bound pool magnetization for the other slices. So this can suppress the signal. And this is a very simple example where we simply ran the sequence twice, once with 12 interleaved slices and once with a single slice, but all the other parameters constant. And you notice that the muscle uh, in this uh, image on the left is attenuated compared to the image in the middle. And this is because of the interaction uh, of the muscle with the bound pool. So the bound uh, pool signal in the muscle is being excited by the other slices, and this is causing an attenuation due to magnetization transfer. And you can look at this difference image, which is quite interesting because the fat does not exhibit magnetization transfer. Uh, so you take this difference image and you can actually suppress the fat here which is kind of cute. Okay, so let's just look at CEST, which is chemical exchange saturation transfer. 
And now we're going to apply the RF saturation at a certain frequency here because there are interactions going on uh, between uh, the, the free water and what's called the solute here. And these are happening at a certain frequency here. So if we apply the saturation at certain frequencies, we'll actually get different attenuation. So we can basically have some magnetization transfer that's sort of frequency independent. But then what we can do is we can excite at a positive and a negative uh, frequency with respect to excite saturating on resonance. And we can look at the difference here, and that's called the cest asymmetry here. And that cest asymmetry is, uh, is what gives us the cest signal. And this is a very uh, specific signal to the, the chemical composition that we're looking at here because it occurs at a very specific frequency, unlike magnetization transfer, which happens over a range of frequencies. Okay, and then looking back at our previous lectures, we looked at extended phase graphs, and this is some very interesting work where we can actually model magnetization transfer effects in EPG, and therefore simulate the magnetization transfer effect of any sequence. And essentially what happens is we add one state to EPG for the bound, uh, the bound pool, but we only have to model the longitudinal component because the T2 is so short that any transverse component dies out almost immediately. So we end up with four states in EPG instead of three. So this is kind of interesting. So another interesting thing we can do is long T2 suppression. So with T2 weighted imaging, of course, we suppress the short T2 signal. But here, if we're doing ultra short echo time imaging, we might want to look at the very short T2, T2 tissues. So what we might want to do is suppress the long T2 tissues to improve this contrast further. So what you want, might want to do is a, a subtraction approach where you simply have a short echo time minus the long echo time. And then any T2 that's quite long will simply cancel out. And this works fairly well. But another approach is to do what's called a long T2 suppression. This is a very nice paper that shows this. If you think about the long T2 in the frequency domain, this is actually a narrow spectrum, and the short T2 has a broader spectrum. So you can apply an RF pulse that has a sort of narrow band, and this is actually a long RF pulse. And what happens is you tend to suppress the signal, excite the signal from the long T2s. So at right, you see that the long T2 gets tipped the full 90 degrees, and the short T2 doesn't get tipped very much. So we're able to then dephase the long T2 signal and go about our imaging. So this is what it looks like in the sequence. We have this long T2 suppression, so we can shape this pulse, but it's actually quite a low amplitude pulse that's slowly tipping the long T2 signal with, while leaving the short T2 alone. Now another way to think of this is if our tip is very slow and we have a short T2, that magnetization is actually simply, the T2 decay is just bringing it back to the longitudinal axis. Uh, repeatedly while we're trying to excite it. So we never really are able to tip it away. And that may be another way to, to think of this. Now then we can uh, apply this to a, an ultra short echo time imaging sequence. The half pulse shown there is one of the excitation approaches used to achieve a very short uh, echo time while achieving slice selectivity. Um, and uh, the PR here is projection reconstruction because it's a radial readout. So these are examples of the images that you can achieve with this. So you can have an ultra short echo time image of the brain as seen on the left. But if you do this long T2 suppression, you see that we get very good contrast here. And this is uh, typically showing myelin in the brain because we're able to suppress the white and gray matter signal in the brain here. So a final uh, preparation that we look at here is diffusion weighted imaging. And we'll spend an entire lecture looking at diffusion but here what we do is we excite the signal with an RF pulse, and then we're going to play very large gradients on either side of a 180 degree pulse. And we're going to look at what happens when we have no diffusion on the left and when we have diffusion on the right. And imagine that all these spins are within one voxel. So we play the sequence and we get dephasing by the first gradient, but notice on the right, the spins are actually moving around. And then we play our refocusing pulse with, which flips everything over we play another gradient, and as these spins on the right move, they don't come back to their uh, refocused position. 
whereas on the left, the spins are, are well refocused. So what we see is we see this attenuation of the signal from the diffusing spins. Now we can use what's called the B value, which characterizes the amount of this diffusion weighting, which is related to the strength of these gradients and the separation of these gradients. We can play a high B value image, which has a lot more diffusion sensitivity. And you see that the fluid in the brain is suppressed in this image. And then we can combine these two to calculate the apparent diffusion coefficient, which is an estimate of the amount of diffusion or diffusivity in the image. So we'll look at diffusion uh, in much more detail. So we've given you a sort of an overview of quite a few different kinds of magnetization preparation, but it turns out there are quite a few more. So we're gonna sort of list some of the other approaches that you might see. So one of them is inflow suppression. So we showed you inflow enhancement when we had the, the signal from blood flowing into an otherwise uh, background suppressed slab. Instead, we can suppress the inflowing blood and we can do what's called black blood imaging, perhaps. We can do flow sensitive suppression, which suppresses the signal based on the actual uh, velocity. We can do what's called a double IR approach, where we do a non-selective inversion, and then we selectively invert uh, either the, the tissue or the blood that's flowing into the tissue. So here, the non-selective inversion will give you a black blood uh, image because the blood is inverted, but then we selectively reinvert everything else, but not the blood. So there are different ways to do this as well. There are also multiple inversion recovery approaches that will simultaneously simultaneously null multiple T1 species. There's arterial spin labeling. And the idea here is you can invert the blood and you can basically uh, measure the perfusion to tissue by subtracting off a reference signal, which doesn't have this inversion. And finally, we can do different diffusion preparations and we can do these with a tip up pulse after the diffusion preparation and then combine them with any sequence. Uh, so one approach is called motion sensitized driven equilibrium, where we actually apply a small amount of diffusion weighting. And this typically is used to actually null out a uh, vessel signal while leaving other signal intact. So now let's summarize this lecture on magnetization preparation. Again, the goal is to modify the contrast before an imaging sequence. We have suppression where we remove or null the signals. We can do this with a spatial saturation, fat saturation, or saturation of, uh, of blood or fluid. We can also alter the contrast of a sequence. We've seen examples here of inversions for enhanced T1 contrast, T2 prep, diffusion contrast, and magnetization transfer. And then there are other things we can look at we can actually encode flow and motion, which we've already seen in other lectures. We can encode diffusion with a preparation and we can do tagging to uh, encode these sort of lines or grid patterns uh, in moving tissue. Okay, so you may wonder a bit more about diffusion preparation and how is diffusion used for numerous different applications. And this will be the topic of the, the next lecture following this lecture.